Check one, two, announcements, Mike. That's good.
Good morning, I'm Pastor Brian, and I'd like to welcome you to Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. Before we get started, we'd like to fill you in on some info for you and your family here at MGBC. If you have a child who becomes restless, we have a live feed of the service in our family room located near the entrance to the children's wing. Mark your calendars. The Jordan Howerton Band will be leading us in a night of worship on Sunday, November the 18th at 7 p.m. in the Worship Center. Cost is $5. Invite your friends, family, and other church groups. Our next communion service will be Sunday, November the 18th, following the worship service. There will be no regular ABF classes or Sunday school classes for grades K through 12. However, child care will be provided for infants through elementary age children who are not participating in communion. Directly after the ABF hour, we will have our skills for your bills, youth auction fundraiser. We will have a meal provided, and then afterwards we will give you the opportunity to uh, win some stuff our students have made. This Wednesday, we will be having youth group over at the park. It will be another skate night from six to eight. At seven o'clock, we will be having a time of worship and a lesson. Our theme for the evening will be Halloween costumes. So we're asking you to keep it church appropriate, so nothing uh, horror related. And the person with the best dress costume will get a prize that evening. Don't forget to set your clocks back one hour for the end of daylight savings time this Saturday. November the 3rd. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. If you missed the announcements or would like more information, please visit our website at mgbconline.com. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church, also those that are watching in Overflow and online. If you would stand with me for the call to worship, and then we'll follow with a word of prayer. Our uh, call to worship this morning is from Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16, if you would join me, please. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Join me in prayer, please. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this morning. We thank you for who you are, for your spirit and for your son, Jesus Christ, that gave his life to pay for our sins, Father. We come before you this morning to worship you, to lift your name up. I pray that we'll be able to put the distractions of the week ahead or the week past or the difficulties in life, Father, that you will speak to us through those and that you will uh, meet each person here, Father, in uh, their appropriate situation in their life. Lord, we just ask your blessing upon our praise and worship. We lift up our voices to you this morning. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, to on that cross. Lay, 
light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since cursed has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand. So it calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand till he returns. Till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. Hey, let's meet and greet each other. If you see someone that you don't know, ask their name, introduce yourself. Right. 
Good morning. I'm Rusty Russell. This is my wife, Kristen. We are, uh, along with our five youngest children, Jared, John, Luke, Matthew, and Mark, we are missionaries to the Ati tribe in Malai, Philippines. Um, we have been, uh, we are also part of New Mission Systems International, um, an organization that has a heart for reaching indigenous people around the world. MGBC has been our church home for 20 plus years, and we're grateful for the long partnership that we've had here with the church body corporately, but also with so many of you individually. It has been uh, a wonderful uh, opportunity for this church family to reach the globe. We are headed back to the Ati people in November for our third term, and we are excited to get back there to do the work that the Lord has called us to do. The Ati people are an indigenous uh, tribe that uh, has been marginalized. Our outreach is focused on coming alongside tribal leadership to uh, assist the Ati with their needs today, but also we use innovative agricultural ways to help them uh, have sustainable solutions to their future. We use our knowledge of agriculture to help them grow more of their own food which decreases their dependence on outsiders and also it improves their, their nutrition because they have a very limited diet. Our purpose is always to build relationships with the goal of sharing the gospel. Our, uh, the Lord has led us to a deep relationship with the teen boys there um, and they actually are um, one of the most troubled groups um, just like anywhere in the world, young men have a challenge um, in life. Each week we host a Bible study in our house that gives us opportunity to build relationships with them. It's grown from just 12 kids to almost 40. We share the Bible and some food. At first we did games and things, but we come to discover we aren't gamers. We want to share the gospel. So we do, and they come, and uh, they we we uh, share what the Lord has taught us and try to transfer that to them. We've been identifying young leaders in this group. We have had two young men that have uh, received training to uh, become leaders within the community. During our time stateside, we've spent six months at Echo Global Farm in Southwest Florida. There the Lord has shown us other missionaries that have had success using the same tools that we've used. Um, but also, uh, our desire is to start an ag training center. It gives people um, a, uh, a tool that is usable, um, and if we can take these young men who have been trained in agriculture, train them in the Bible, and send them out from Malai to reach the other tribes in the Philippines. There are many uh, unreached tribes that have been uh, uh, a challenge to reach. We are... Um, We can impact the kingdom of, of God through these young people. We need to train them and train them right, and that is our goal of the next four years. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be back here in my home church, and um, you guys are all in for a special treat today because um, another connecting part in the States for us has been as uh, we raised the first half of our family here in the Cove, um, as we left for the Philippines, we launched our firstborn um, to Sebring, Florida. We put him in the care of Dr. Andy Smith, and Randy's sharing the message today. So that's kind of neat that the Lord orchestrated both parts of our heart and home to be in one place today. That doesn't happen very often. I can tell you as a person who loves people all over the globe, I'm looking very much forward to eternity when we can all be together praising Jesus because it's really hard to get all the people you love in one room. <laughs> um, we are going to be in the area for about a week. Um, we're prepping our house um, for sale, and um, we would love to meet with any of you individually and share more. There are lots of stories of life transformation within the community that we don't have time to share today. Um, if you'd like to get connected with us and receive email updates, um, we send out an email about monthly, and uh, about four times a year, there's a prayer newsletter that goes out, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back. You can pick up a prayer card to put on your refrigerator to remind you to pray for the Russell family. Um, a couple of prayer points. 
um, as we head back, uh, ask for prayer for smooth transition back into the Philippine culture for our family and travel mercies, of course. Um, pray for opportunities to share the gospel as we enter the Christmas season. Filipinos start celebrating Christmas in September, so we're kind of late, but um, we're looking forward to just having opportunities to um, point back to Jesus in the Christmas season. Um, we were asking that you'd pray that God would give us eyes to see the young men that he is calling out to be leaders in the community, and also for provision of a location for the Ag Training Center. There's a core group of people who've been praying for about a year now about a property. Um, if you would pray for Bingoy and his family, um, they've been friends of ours for about six years, and we're um, really asking the Lord if this could be an opportunity. Uh, it's a nice piece of property for agriculture. It's very near where the tribe is, and so we're just asking that the Lord would provide those needs. And um, also always financial partnerships. Our, our ministry is funded purely by donations from churches and individuals, and um, our needs have been met for our personal use, but all of the needs for the ministry, the growth and the programs that we run there are all come through donors. So partnerships in that way are also a blessing. We just want to thank you for the way that you've partnered with us over the last six years and look forward to see what God will do with us in partnership going forward. I want to invite the elders up and the pastoral staff to come up. And uh, we're going to have a brief word of prayer over the Russells. So if you're an elder or one of the pastors on staff, if you would make your way forward, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, when are you? I missed. You don't know exactly what the following week at some point. Okay, you'll be headed back over. Okay. All right. All right. Scott, would you be willing to pray over them? Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you for Rusty and Kristen. We thank you for their willingness to go forward. And uh, so few people put their hands up and say that uh, I'll go. And so we thank you for their willingness to go. We thank you for their heart for the Athi people. We uh, just pray for uh, success. We pray that this trip would, uh, this term would be a success. We pray that you would give them wisdom and uh, and that you would just bless her ministry there. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, just by way of announcements, a couple of announcements to draw your attention to in your bulletin. There's some inserts there. One with respect to the Jordan Howerton Band, the uh, concert, Praise and Worship Time, as well as the Camp Man and Wagon Fundraiser. Those are both inserts in your bulletin. Also, a communion service. You want to mark on your calendar, November the 18th, communion service. We will do that following the worship service uh, Sunday morning. So we'll have our typical Sunday morning worship service on the 18th. And then during the ABF hour, there'll be no ABFs that day. Uh, and we'll have our communion service, threefold communion service uh, that morning. Sign-up sheets will be circulated uh, next week. And Daryl wanted me to just to, another reminder about the youth fundraiser today following uh, ABF hour, <clears throat> excuse me, down in the fellowship hall. Uh, join us down there if, if you would. And uh, gentlemen, if you would come this morning for our tithes and offerings, I would ask that you would join me in prayer for the uh, families affected by the events yesterday at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. We want to uh, lift them up before our Lord for healing, for the community of healing, and for uh, those that are recovering both uh, physically and emotionally from the devastation of that event. So would you join me, please? Father, you are a sovereign God in control over all things. And uh, the events yesterday in Pittsburgh, Father, are as an opportunity for you to bring glory to yourself. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you will just uh, draw near to those families, express to them the peace that comes from, uh, from you, Father, and that that, uh, that community will be unified together across religious, across racial, across social, economic boundaries. Father, I just ask that... Uh, you would work and provide healing there. We pray for those uh, families that are struggling with the loss of loved one. We pray for those that uh, sell family that are being hospitalized, that uh, you would heal and would bring them back uh, to, to full healing and completeness, Father. And we just ask that you would move with power and strength in that situation there in Pittsburgh. 
And Lord, this morning, we offer up these tithes and offerings to you. We give back to you something you have just freely blessed us and give us so graciously. You give to us. And, and Father, we want to worship you with what you have provided to us. We ask this in the name of your son. Amen. As we worship through giving this morning, um, let's just take some time to, to pray and to reflect. Um, spend some time talking to Jesus. We're going to sing the song, Stand in Your Love. We've done it a couple times over the past few months. Um, and the chorus just repeats, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And I think sometimes uh, songs are written that way with repetition because if we don't repeat it, it's hard for it to sink into our heads and into our hearts. Um, so maybe you're dealing with some stress or some anxiety or or dealing with something uh, that nobody even knows about, um, and, it's, and it's caused fear in your life. Um, take some time to, to spend time with Jesus here and, and, and think about his love. Think about how his love covers us. Uh, and the thought from this song comes from uh, 1 John 4.18, uh, where we've been camping out the past couple of weeks uh, throughout 1 John. So take some time to think on that. Maybe even open up a Bible and read that if you'd like to. Um, we'll stand and we'll sing together once the plates make it to the back of the balcony. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I owe When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love shame no longer has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power. stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Sing that one more time. 
one more time. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in Show me who you are and feel me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who can ever say, worthy of every breath we can ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you.
introduce a new one this morning, at least new to the congregation. It's been out for a little bit. Um, this song's kind of been on my radar for a couple months, but uh, two weeks ago, a few of the pastors and I um, and a few others traveled to Ocean City for a retreat for ministry leaders, and uh, I got to co-lead with um, a worship pastor. Or I guess he just planted a church, but he's also a worship pastor from Maryland, and uh, he said, hey, I want to do this song a couple times. And like I said, I've been planning on doing it for a while, but whenever we had a group of uh, about 50, mostly men in the room, just belting it out, um, the words really came alive to me. And uh, if you were at the men's retreat, you already heard me say this, but the last time we sang it at this retreat, um, I started thinking about this first verse, you know, at, at first glance. Um, and this song is, it's, a, it's about salvation. It's about the, the chasm between us and God, and Christ came to fill that. Um, and it, it definitely is about that, but I got saved when I was about four or five, and it, it's kind of hard to remember before that point. Um, but more recently, I, I've had struggles, um, I, you know, I've dealt with anxiety, and, and I've had points where I, I just couldn't see God, I couldn't, couldn't hear Him, um, had questions. And, and whenever I put it in that context and looked at this first verse, how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Uh, maybe you got saved more recently, and that um, it's just fresh in your mind, and maybe these words will trigger that awesome memory for you. Maybe you're like me, and you got saved when you were a little kid, um, but you've had something more recently where, in desperation, you turned to heaven and spoke Jesus' name into the night. Um, either way, I hope this song really connects with you and, and impacts you in, in a way that, um, in a similar way that it did to me. I was going to try to multitask and tune my guitar while I did that, and that did not work out. So sorry for the quick interruption. Uh, we're going to start on the chorus. I can share this, Ryan, with the men's retreat over the weekend. Ladies, if you want to hear 50-plus men singing and worshiping the Lord, that was actually the first time I was ever at a men's retreat. And to see the heart of, of men and lifting their voices. We had microphones, but I don't know about you, Ryan. I could hear the men over us worshiping God. So for those men, let's, let's be clear, at home, I wear the pants when my wife lends them to me. Okay, but this weekend we got to we got to worship the Lord together with men, and and uh, it was it was awesome. Now, I putting the humor aside, it was just great to be with those who love the Lord and just open up their lives to share with one another. The small groups, uh, the large groups, but in worship time, it was awesome. I'll teach you the chorus first. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings. Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who's 
Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared, The grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning, then came the morning that sealed the promise. Father, you are a living hope. Risen from the grave, your son, Jesus Christ, paid for the sins of this world, Father. May we never forget the magnitude of that gift, the grace and the mercy. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that your spirit will just move through each one of us, meet us where we are. As Pastor Randy comes and speaks, I just ask that you would anoint him, speak through him. Father, again, open our hearts and our minds. May we truly walk out of here different than we are right now because of the power of your spirit and the power of the very word of God. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Children, you are dismissed out the doors to my right over here. As Greg indicated, this weekend we had our men's retreat. And you noticed last week we had an all-female praise and worship team. This week an all-men's praise and worship team. They did a great job. I want to thank them for their willingness to do that. Uh, we invited Randy, or Pastor Tim invited Randy, uh, Dr. Randy Smith, to come up for our men's retreat and speak and did a great job over this weekend. Many, many challenges. I know each man walked out of there with a, with a true challenge on their heart. Uh, Randy is the pastor at Grace Church of Sebring. 
He is also the director of Grace uh, Commission Bible Institute. Uh, is it Grace or Great? Great. Great. great, correct? Okay, great. All right. Great Commission Bible Institute. Uh, he has developed a one-year curriculum, and many of our students here, some of the Stearns, some of the Russells, have gone through that curriculum. So if you have some info or questions about that, you can certainly talk to those families. And he has developed a one-year curriculum in which he goes one year through the entire book, teaching uh, through the various uh, books of the Bible. He also leads tours throughout Europe and the Holy Land. His passion is teaching. That's what he is passionate about. So here's what I want you to do this morning. I want to encourage you, first of all, even if you're not a note taker, I think you're going to want to take notes. Uh, his notes are on version, and you know how to get there, version, and then events, and click on that. His notes are there, but you may want to jot some things down because it would have been impossible for me to go through the retreat over the weekend and not take notes because there was so much good stuff. In addition to that, I know you've heard this before, but if you have not been on YouTube to watch one hour, one book, in which he takes one book of the Bible and teaches through the entire book in one hour. And I have no idea how, Ben, you do that, right? You, you do the editing. I think Ben does the editing on that, right, Ben Russell? I don't know how he puts that together in one hour. But anyways, you guys do a great, great job with that. So I want to invite you to come and uh, speak to us this morning, and uh, welcome. Well, thanks, Pastor. I was so blessed by the men. I have to tell you, this has been a great time of refreshment for me. The Lord knew, to, knew that I needed to get away and to get with your men. What great stories. I'm not going to tell all of you because it's men things, but um, really a great time together. While I'm here, a young man who grew up and ran around the halls of this church is in the pulpit in Sebring, Florida. I now live half of my life in Sebring and the other half in the Mediterranean, so I'm gone six months of the year, and Ben Russell does the preaching during that six months while I'm gone. And so we share the pulpit together. Beloved, we are living in a time that is divided in this country in a way that I've never seen. How about you? It's amazing how divided many people are. Unless you lived on an isolated island a couple of weeks ago during the Kavanaugh hearings, you know that we lived in the most divisive time in recent memory. But what I found encouraging, and by the way, there was something encouraging, I found encouraging that while the pundits were saying America's sky is falling, I found it interesting and I was encouraged that people on both sides of a debate had come to the conclusion that the best way to pick out what a man's character was, was to examine how he behaved. In other words, still left within our society that is quickly trying to divest itself of all things God, there's still the notion that a person's character shows up in the activities in their daytimer and the charges in their checkbook. In other words, what we do has a lot to do with what we believe. Jesus said, our heart is exposed by the thing we treasure most in life. You want to know what's important to you? Look at what you spent the week doing. You want to know what you really value? Think about what you've been thinking about. Now, after Jesus, one of the followers, the youngest follower of the disciple group, went on and wrote a series of letters because by now, all the rest of his colleagues were dead. They tried to kill him. They tried to boil him in oil. His name was John the Evangelist, and the boy just wouldn't boil. And they eventually sent him to Patmos, tried to get rid of him, and there God gave him the book of Revelation. You just can't keep this guy down. And here's the thing about John. Late in his life, he's an aged pastor of a group of people that are two different groups. I want you to be the church at Ephesus today. This half over here, we're going to call you the kosher kids. You grew up eating in kosher delis as a Jew. And when you found Jesus, it was because you saw the promises to Isaiah and you grabbed onto them and said Jesus was the Messiah fulfilling those promises. Now, you had a lot of strange laws that the rest of the world didn't follow, but nevertheless, you were believers in Messiah Jesus and you were trusting him alone for your salvation. The problem is the other half, you guys. You're what we call the pig-eating pagans. 
that found Jesus. You have lived your life in all manner of evil like Ham and whatnot. And so now you've found Jesus, and you're all in the same church, but they got a different menu than you do. And now you've come to Jesus, and John is trying to bring these guys together, and he's trying to make one point. The book we're looking at is 1 John, where I'm heading is 4, but I'm going to start in 1. Give me just a moment to get there and skip a stone across the pond. Here's what I want you to see. He writes a letter that now is five chapters, but you're reading somebody else's mail. So before it was five chapters, it was one letter. Read it like a letter. And when you drop your eyes in the first four verses of the first chapter, you're going to see that he's trying to begin a message to say simply these words. Your life choices expose if you're really a Christian. Your life choices expose if you're really a Christian. There are markers that indicate whether somebody's truly a part of the body or not. They include words, but they're not just words. How many of you know people who comfortably espouse something in words but live the opposite? They're called Americans. We say we hate scandal, but we buy the news when there's a scandal. And you can tell we say this, but we do this. John wrote the first epistle of John, and when he wrote it, he boiled the message down to this. There are four vital things you need to know about our faith. Whether you're in it or outside of it, there's four things you need to know about it. And the first one is in the first section. It starts in 1-1 to 2-15. It's one section of a letter that later on somebody put numbers on top of. Don't be distracted by those. The first four verses open up powerfully to say this. Our message was always true. That's why verse 1 says it came from in the beginning. It was a historical reality. That's why he says, we touched Jesus. This wasn't some long ago and far away in a galaxy far beyond. We touched him. We talked to him. And our message revealed life in verse 2, and it showed the Heavenly Father in a dramatic way. It was purposefully communicated. And by verse 4, he says, I want you to know that there is joy that comes from our message. If you know Jesus Christ, you have the resolute assurance that God has neither lost interest nor the power to deal with your problems. That's joy. Joy isn't happiness. You can have joy at the funeral of a loved one. Because you know God is on the throne and he hasn't forgotten you. That's joy. And then you get down to verse 5 and he says, he, he uses high contrast language. He says, this is the message we heard from him and announce it to you. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. See, our message, just like our God, is not some kind of murky shadow, some kind of spiritual force. It's offered in content. It's true. It's powerful. Our message shows the kind of clarity of the God that we serve. You've got to understand that in the philosophical environment of first century Rome, they believed heavily something that we're starting to see emerge on college campuses across America. They believed that truth was kind of a relative and personal thing, and faith was some kind of sentimental, traditional nicety, but faith wasn't really necessary, and truth wasn't really true. You're starting to hear this all across the country. I travel into college campuses, and it's amazing when somebody says, my truth and your truth, I always say the same thing. How's that working with your bank book? Can you walk in the bank and say, well, my truth is I'm a millionaire, and suddenly they have to believe it? Because I want to bank where you bank. Here's the problem. Pastor John recognized that people were claiming to follow Jesus. So he put it in terms of light and darkness, our message or not. He high contrasted because there were people that seemed to think, you probably never met anybody like this, but there were people in the first century that already seemed to think that they could redefine the essence of Christianity and shape it to something that was more comfortable for them. You've never heard of anyone doing that, have you? 
In fact, the end of the first chapter, look at verses 6 and 7. He says there's people that are saying things. Do you see the words they say or they claim in verse 6 and verse 8 and verse 10? He says some people are claiming to be Christians, but they're walking like they're not in verses 6 and 7. Wow! You mean people might actually say they're Christians to get elected? How shocking. News at 11. Or maybe down in verses 8 and 9, he says some people are claiming they don't even need cleansing. They're self-deceived. Do you know anybody who has incredible confidence but few skills? It's, Amer it's amazing that American education produces the 33rd in math but the highest in self-image. That's amazing to me. Now, when you get down to verse 10, it says, some people are claiming, we're not rebellious by nature. My self-will is not my default switch. They're just not telling the truth, he said. So, so people were making claims, but they weren't true. They weren't consistent with what God's word had taught about Jesus followers. You want to know what Jesus follower John says? You look at their life. You look at their life. And the whole first part of the letter argued that the message of Jesus is fixed. It's reliable. It's not malleable. Because, guys, we're not Jesus' PR firm that was hired to somehow make his message more palatable to the modern audience. Our job is an ambassador for Christ. We're called to make it clear, to deliver it with clarity, but not try to make it nicer than it is. By the way, you know a message nicer than I can be freed from my sin and spend the rest of my life in victory with Christ who paid for my sin? So his first point then is clarity is at the center. Facts are at the center of our faith. It's not sentimentalism. Now when I get to the second section, I pick it up and I start reading and I see that believers in 2.15 shouldn't embrace this world and anticipate fulfillment in this system. Guys, a temporary world system will not produce permanent fulfillment. It's a temporary system by nature. So you cannot read the end of chapter 2 and not realize there are some consequences for your choices. See, because he says, not only is our faith rooted in facts, but in chapter 2, verse 16, to the end of chapter 2, he says, if you want to see a Christian, it's not only the facts they believe, it's the persistence of their following. He says, it's not just saying you believe it, it's sticking to it. It's sticking to it. So John offered a simple truth down in 219, that they were among us, but they weren't really with us. And the reason I know that is they fell in love with something, but it wasn't Jesus. Let me make the argument that people are going to flock into churches today across the America, and some of them, what they want is a plumbing fix. They don't have enough money for the month. Their relationship fell apart. Their business goals didn't happen. And as a result, they came into the church not to fall in love with Jesus, but to get a solution to their problem. There's nothing wrong with that, because most of us met Jesus while getting a solution to a problem so that he could teach us what our real problem was. The whole thing is, though, at some point you have to meet Jesus or you're not Christian. And so at the bottom line, guys, if you hang out in church circles very long, you're going to know that a lot of people come to Jesus with no consideration of the cost of Christianity. They don't know what it means to be a Christian. They don't know what it's going to cost them. And frankly, it's costing more now than it used to, so it's harder for people to make the decision to get in. I would tell you this. There's a lot of people who stand, spend a time in church but never actually find Jesus. It's a stage of life thing. They come for a while, and while they're here, they connect to other people, and they say, I have needs, and I just feel like I'm now connecting to people. But after a while, they fade out, and they're not part of us because they didn't connect to Jesus. They connected to the organization. And, 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 and when John is writing, he says, he says, you can't look at their defection and determine whether or not what we're saying is true. Guys, listen. You can't determine that because most Americans can't balance a checkbook that mathematics is flawed. It's not math that's the problem. So you don't look at a person and go, well, if they left, the message must not be true. 
That's not the way you evaluate the message. The fact is people do begin with Jesus and his church, and they do walk out. I know some, and so do you. But John goes on to a third point. He says, look, our faith is factually based, historically based. Our faith is something you should be persistent in, and your persistence in walking with, loving, and following Jesus will show our faith. And then he goes to a third point in 1 John 3, and here's where we've got to be careful. 1 John can get used to say a lot of stuff that God never said. Because 1 John is like a Roman legal document. I don't know if you ever read any laws. I'm the guy that read the whole Affordable Care Act. I read the whole thing. Can I tell you, it's almost not, it's not about health care. It's about a mechanism of delivery of payment. It has nothing to do with the quality of health care. Really, it doesn't. But about a third of the entire document, it, like in most law, is actually, when we say man, we mean a male biologically. When we say dog, we mean a canine. When we say fence, we mean a bar... So there's definitions that go all the way through, and that's how you determine what the law is stated on. Laws that get thrown out are laws that say vague things that are not self-defined. Now, I'm going somewhere. Hang in there. In John, he self-defines what terms mean. So when John uses words, he doesn't use them the way the rest of the Bible does. Don't grab from John and run out and start uh, poking it on other parts of the Bible. John is very specific in his argument. So, for instance, in chapter uh, 2, verse 15, he says, you shouldn't love the world. He's not saying I'm anti-green and, and I don't like ecology and trash the planet. He's saying in verse 16... That world as I define it is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. So when I say world, you should hear those three things. That's what I mean. That's an easy one. Let's go to a harder one. Go to ch uh, chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Why? Because in my definition of my document, sin is lawlessness. Do you see it? Now, the word anomia, the word lawlessness, does not mean doesn't have rules. The word lawlessness, you should fill it in your mind, makes up his own rules. So sin is a person, a person who's walking in sin is a person who's making up their own rules. Satan has made up his own rules from the beginning, chapter 3 says. And that's why when you get down to verse 6, it says, No one who abides in him sins. Now, how many of you are unapologetically Christian? I belong to Jesus. How many of you, keep your hand up, how many of you would raise the other hand, and I didn't sin once this week? But I just read... No one who abides in him sins. Cross out the word sins and put in the definition. Makes up his own rules. And then you'll understand what he's saying. He's saying that the chief way you identify a Jesus follower is do they follow the rules as Jesus gave them in his word or do they make up their own rules? Increasingly, you're seeing it across our nation as we are cobbling together a new morality in contradistinction to the Judeo-Christian ethic. Let me bring that down a couple notches. We're making it up. And I have found that either people start with God in a relationship with God and the revelation of God in, chat, in, the, in the Word of God, or they go to old Oprah episodes and cobble together a morality based on stuff they had from memes and decide whether that's moral, and then go to the Bible and judge the Bible by the memes. That's what they do. Well, God would never do that, because you know what I think about God, and I feel this way about God, and so I'm just sure you're making it up. And that's increasingly becoming how people understand. They're inventing a moral standard, and they don't believe that what God said in his word is more important than what Huffington Post said, because there's a great source for theology. And they're grabbing the holy writ of Facebook, because that's where you find truth. So John's point was, 
One who doesn't know Jesus can be identified best by one character trait. Listen to me. If you're walking on the college campus, there's one trait more than any that marks the Christian from the non. It's not their hairstyle or their t-shirt. Where did they get the rules of life from? Did they take him from his word? Is what's right what God says? Or do they judge what's right and then tell God how to be God? Do you know how many Christians are walking around espousing a Bible they wish God wrote? If God could have got his act together and talked to me in the 21st century, he would have been okay. Come on, Jesus, get tolerant. What's your problem? And here's the thing. You have to understand that when you don't fix the ethical, moral anchor to the eternal word of God, you are ever subject to what is right today is wrong tomorrow. But what's wrong today is not only right tomorrow, but we defy you to say it's wrong or we'll lock you in jail. And what you see rising in our streets is coming from our newsrooms and our movie screens and our classrooms and now from our halls of power. It's people that are expressing the idea that it's possible to claim you're Christian but make up your own rules. See, this is my version of Christianity. This is my truth. So when I get to chapter 4, look at verse 1. It says, there's a fourth thing I want you to know. You see, it's truth persistently held to that isn't cobbled together or made up, but comes from the revelation of God's word. And then in chapter 4, he starts in 4 and 5, the last part, and he says, real believers can be spotted. Put them under a microscope, and you're going to see Jesus' blood going through their veins. He says it this way. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. I want you to understand, in the first six verses, he outlines that the facts about Jesus are non-negotiable. The position of Jesus is non-negotiable. The power of Jesus is greater. He's greater in you than he that is in the world. That is a non-negotiable. And he says, I don't care what's popular, I'm telling you what's true. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just make the argument that most people were wrong in human history most of the time about most things? Popularity is a terrible way to come up with truth. But you see, when you don't base morality on the word of God that's timeless, you base it on whatever's popular. And then your morality just keeps changing as the memes change on Instagram. Verse 5 says, they're from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We're from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Well, how judgy is that? He's actually walking around saying he knows the truth, and they don't. But you see, truth is binary. You don't have your personal truth. It doesn't work in architecture. It doesn't work in engineering. It doesn't work in science. It doesn't work in math. And it shouldn't work in social science or morality either. Half the university is over there saying truth is relative. The other half is saying you got to engineer by these principles or the building will fall down. So we have schizophrenic universities. And you get down to verse 7, and he says believers are not only known by truth that's unmoved, they're known by relationship. Look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. See, just because we're people of truth does not mean we're mean. When did conservatives get so nasty? It literally says, one who knows God reflects his character. He loves people. One who's, who gives sacrificially. One who gives purposefully in verse 10. One who follows the actions that God modeled in verse 11. One who becomes a testimony to the world like God said we should in verse 12. One who fuels love with the enabling of the Spirit. Believers ought to be people of truth that are unmoved in truth, but incredibly loving people. You ought to find here warmth, not swords. And John 4.14 4 says, We've seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You, you read 7 to 14, and he's going to argue forcefully that loving each other is the appropriate response for the model of what Jesus gave us. God loves. Listen, if you're not sure, this is the biblical definition of love. 
acting deliberately to meet a need because there's a need, expecting nothing in return. My wife got up at 3 a.m. when the baby cried because I wasn't born with the equipment and she was going to feed the baby. And I'm telling you that she didn't knock it up and say, oh, I feel warm and gushy. Well, maybe she did, but I, she's not saying, I feel so warm that I've got to love this child. She knew what the child needed. She gave what the child needed. The only thing she got back was a burp. Nothing flattering. And then the child goes back to sleep. God didn't look at the earth and go, oh, they're so cute. Let me send Jesus. He so loved the world, he acted to meet our need because there's a need, expecting nothing in return because we got nothing to give him that he doesn't already own. And so we get down to, to the end, and we see in 14 and 15 that believers are marked by truth, and they're marked by love, but they're marked by mission. 14 says, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Verse 15 says, who confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him, and, and he in God. John is transfixed on proclaiming the identity of a believer. You can hear it in their testimony. They're all about Jesus. Did you see? Did you see the songs there? None of them celebrated the great morality of the Martinsburg Church. Not a single one up there said, great are we, America, go team. They all said, man, I'm a mess and Jesus loved me. That's our message. Our message is incredibly inclusive because all you have to do is be a sinner, and I don't know anybody who isn't. And at that point, it says, Jesus loves me, and he loves me so much. We have a faith that can be expressed in simple terms. God made man without sin. Man's default switch was, I can do it my way. He pulled a Sinatra, did it his way, and ended up blowing the whole thing. And Jesus came to set us free. Now look, I got to quit, so I want you to get down to verses 16 through 19 and just look at how he closes in chapter 4. John offers one more marker. Don't miss this one. It's, it's absolute truth. It's rooted in love. It's on mission, but it's incredibly confident. Look at what he says. John offered that with absolute allegiance to the truth and authentic and costly love to brothers and sisters and a constant view toward mission, we can be incredibly confident. Look at the word know. We know God's love, verse 16. We know God. Look at verse 17. We know the day of judgment is coming, but we're not afraid of it. We're waiting for Jesus. Come on, Jesus. And he says, honestly, we don't fear because of his love in verse 18. The whole point is, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. God's love is initiating, ours is responsive. We didn't try to figure out how to find God. We were just doing what we were. Most of you came to Jesus on a day you weren't looking for him. He collided into your life. And here's the truth. Christianity teaches that I'm bathed in the love of God. I can live out the truth of God. I can be warm in his love. Know that God loves me because he showed me love in what Jesus did. Greater love is no man than this. I want to close this with a simple story. It comes out of a writer from USA Today. Jack Kelly, who's the foreign editor, wrote this. He said, we were in Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, during a famine. It was so bad, we walked into one village and everybody was dead. The stench of death that gets in your hair and gets on your skin and gets in your clothes, you can't wash it off. We saw this little boy. You could tell he had worms and was malnourished. His stomach was protruding. And when a child is extremely malnourished, his, his dark hair turns a reddish color and the skin becomes crinkled like he's 100 years old. Our photographer had a grapefruit. So he gave it to the boy, but the boy was so weak he couldn't open the grapefruit, so our photographer cut it in half and handed it to him, thinking he was going to eat it. But the little boy pulled his body, grabbed the grapefruit, and began walking down the street. We couldn't stand it, so we followed him. He couldn't see us. And then our, our, our jaw dropped open when we saw there was another little boy lying in the street. We thought he was dead already. That was the brother of this boy. He fed his younger brother. He chewed some of the grapefruit and put it in his younger brother's mouth. His younger brother was laying there, glazed over, and began to chew. Three days later, we found out that the boy that carried the grapefruit had died. 
but his brother had lived because he had been bringing him all of his food for the last week of his life. Beloved, I have a faith that is rooted not in just words and historical details, though they are true. I have a faith that's rooted in the most incredible act of love ever. Jesus lay his hands down and let them drive nails in them, was placed on a cross and had the power to walk away. And he did it because he knew that was the way God could show his love to me and to you. He did it because talk is cheap, and from the cheap seats you can tell me you love me, but until you hurt for me, you haven't shown me that you love me. And in the bottom line, at the final analysis, John just wanted you to know something. We aren't silly sentimentalists. We didn't come here to celebrate Jesus because we're like, you know, got nothing better to do on a Sunday morning. We, Listen, if this is sentimentalism, sleep in. You'll get more out of it. We came here because we're serious people who met somebody who changed our destiny because he showed love like nobody else ever showed love to me. Nobody ever showed love to me like him. Here's the mystery of Jesus. He knows you. He knows you on the subatomic level. He knows every malevolent thought you ever thought, and he still loves you. And if that doesn't show you God's love, then know this. One day soon, a trumpet will sound, and you will see him, and some will shrink away. But I'm telling you, many of us are going to be going, come now, Lord Jesus. This is the one who showed me love. I just want you to know it. Father, thank you this morning for the opportunity to look back into what John wrote. Words are not sufficient for me to be able to say what needs to be said about the passage. All I can say to you, Father, is my faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Oh God, don't let me try to base my life on a cobbled together morality that I put together from some leaflets and some ideas and uh, help me to, to understand that my faith rests in the historical reality that Jesus came, he walked, he lived, he was crucified for me, he was my substitute, I deserve that penalty for railing against you and in my default rebellion against you, you gave me an opportunity to come and receive salvation you did it with such love you did it with everything I need perfect lamb was slain oh how thankful we are help us be people of hope people of optimism because I know the end and this is as close to hell as I'm ever gonna get my future's brighter not cuz I'm better but because you're good Thank you for being my God and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Please stand with us. don't have love I waste my breath with every song I bring an empty voice a hollow noise if I speak with a silver tongue convince a crowd but don't have love I leave a bitter taste with every word I say Let my life be the proof the proof of your
soul but don't have love and who is poor it seems all the poverty is found in me so let my life be the proof the proof of your love let my love look like you and what you're made Father, as we go this week, as we interact with our families, our friends, our loved ones, our community, let our love reflect you. Father, give us keen awareness through the power of your spirit of those around us that are in need. Let us love like you. Let us set aside all of the the notions of truth that we have and how we want to bend things to fit our own needs and and, and, and twist things to, to, to make our decisions right, Father, and fall on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Father, help us to love like you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ.